and I need to let you guys know that right now the, the session is being recorded. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. Um, Wiley Plus. Okay, somebody had a question to explain about Wiley Plus. Um, basically, Wiley Plus gives you the ability to go, it's like an electronic dashboard. It's like a similar dashboard to Moodle, but you've got access to all the um, assignment questions and solutions, as well as the e-textbook. So that's basically what Wiley Plus is. So does that answer your question, Weehoo? Now, like I said, I'm gonna have a Wiley rep coming in next Friday to, to further explain. But does that make sense? Just say yes, uh, you, Han. Hi, um, will you make the questions available on um, Wiley Plus? That was uh, my question. The there. only questions I'm making available is the, the assignments that I posted on Word. Okay. Now, unless we go through a specific problem in Wiley Plus. Now, Wiley Plus is exactly the same as a textbook. It's just basically in an e-textbook file, but the only difference is you've got access to the assignments and the, and the solutions to this, all the assignments and all the solutions to them. That's the only difference, so. And like I said, I'm gonna be posting a lot, a lot of the questions that you need to study. So, so it's up to you. So can we just use Wiley Plus and not get the textbook? Yeah, you can easily do that, Jason. Because like I said, Wiley Plus has got the e-textbook right there. Anyways, that's my understanding. Okay, so let me just jump to the slides. Chapter one. All right. Do I need to make that bigger? Can everyone see that? Yeah, good. I can see it. That's good. Yeah, I can see it. Yeah. Okay. Now, again, feel free to jump in. The more, the merrier. So, as we go through this course, you'll see differences and similarities between financial and managerial accounting. Most of you have taken financial accounting courses. Um, most of you have taken Management 2400 as well, if not other management accounting courses. So you should be able to differentiate or see the differences. Now, we're gonna do some financial accounting income statements. We'll do some comparisons on what it looks between a contribution margin statement, um, which is more management accounting driven. And you can see the differences, but it's not only differences. I mean, they're related. Financial accounting statements, management accounting statements, there is some relationship. It's not like you're pulling numbers out of a hat. So as a management accountant, I'm, I may be drilling down on a revenue number from the income statement. I may be drilling down through a cost of goods sold number from an audited income statement. I may be drilling down in some asset information. Um, to give any integrity to any management accounting you're doing, you're always going to do your due diligence and balance back to whether it's quarterly financial statements, monthly financial statements, or audited financial statements. Anyone hard looking? Oh, so we got Santana advertising. Okay, good. Keep going, Santana. Can I have access to the Wiley? I'm just going through some of the questions as we go through this. Okay, learning objectives. You'll see many of these objectives when you go into your CPA course as well, corporate governance, code of conduct. Um, not only through um, associations, I'm sure a lot of people where you worked, you had to sign a handbook, employee handbook or a code of conduct policy. Has anybody ever seen a whistleblower policy where they work? Um, a lot of um, 
public companies will publish whistleblower policies. Um, so everybody thinks cost accounting, well, many people think cost accounting is just financial. You're just crunching numbers. Not, not, not so. We've got non-financial information that needs to be um, analyzed as well. So as I mentioned, in this course, we'll be doing more analysis and financial tools, but there will be some non-financial information and communication of that as well. Um, as I said, not only the classification of numbers, but how the numbers are used for management strategies. Um, so can anybody give me one example of a, a strategy or possible strategy? Now, when a company starts, they start with a strategic plan. So part of that strategic plan is, does everybody know what a mission statement is? Don't be shy, text me. Yes, no. Yes, I know. Uh, sorry, I know what a mission statement is. So Yihan knows, okay, so you've heard of a mission statement. Basically, what sets you apart? What target market are you going after? What price are you gonna be more? Um, low cost differentiation, high cost, higher price, premium pricing, that's all part of your management strategies. Um, again, when we're analyzing management accounting information, and I mentioned this early on, to offer integrity, the, the numbers must always tie back to your financial statements. So you got your set of financial statements, your balance sheet income statement. When you're analyzing your management accounting, you're always tying back to the financial information. And past performance to predict the future. Yes, you do a lot of historical information, but you also, you're also doing future information. Good example is present values and cash flow analysis. You're not gonna see much of that in this course, but I'm sure you've seen it in finance. So here's a good chart. Now, basically comparing managerial and financial, I think the big difference Although there are rules for managerial accounting, financial statements are run by standards. Whether it's GAAP, IFRS, ASPE, there's always a standard, non-for-profit um, with PSAP. So that's one of the major differences between financial and managerial. Um, time span, managerial, the analysis could be two weeks, it could be three years. Um, there's a set period with financial statements. You file them annually or quarterly. Um, usually companies run a monthly statement as well. And then the quarterly statements has some inter interim audit as well. Um, primary users, managerial. This is kind of iffy. I see managers using financial statements as well. Uh, but financial is more geared to external users. So external users, investors, creditors, they'll look at um, financial statements. Most creditors will never ask for a, a managerial statement. Um, now, one thing I wanted, like I said, the lines between managerial and financial statements are getting blurred. Financial accounting is becoming more future oriented. There's a push to more fair value accounting. Um, good example, does everybody know IFRS 16? I think it's IFRS 16. Which one is the um, is fixed asset? Assets is IFRS 16, correct? Who knows the IFRS standards here? Not me. Don't, not everybody jump. IFRS 16 is um, basically the valuation of assets. You've got an option to fair value your assets. So just an example that financial accounting is going to fair valuation. Operations, 
looking at different departments that drive management accounting, it starts with operations. So operations convert the resources and services, but before anything, before operations can start, you have a strategic plan. So mission statement, we just talked about it, vision statements, core competencies, um, environmental analysis, SWOT, orders model is another example. Um, for the purposes of this course, you basically need to know what a strategic plan is, but we're not gonna drill down to the details. So this is what chapter one is basically about. What is a mission statement? What are the core competencies? What's SWAT mission statement? That's all part of your strategic plan. And as we mentioned, we did talk a little about strategies. Um, there's cost leadership, quality products, low prices, um, value leadership, higher value products and services. I mean, these are just two examples. Generally, most textbooks go through three strategies. There could be a lot more. There's niche products out there that have different strategies. That's not necessarily price or um, quality driven. So um, value chain. Now, I talked to about at least seven or eight people here who are going for their, well, supply chain. But we'll talk about supply chain. So who could tell me what a value chain is? You can text it. So who can tell me what a value chain is? Generally, the slides telling us the value chain is the business functions and costs. But how do I, how do I expand my value chain? How do I um, maybe decrease my value chain? Give me an example. Um, so this is Tammy. Uh you probably you have to increase the number of activities that give the organization value because that's what the value chain is so can you give me an example of a, an activity you might increase um the type of uh, amount of services you offer um yeah. on for example a new type of or a new brand of pants in a superstore of clothes. Yes, so that expands your value chain as far as possibly the marketing side and sales side for sure. Yeah, or how about if you, you know, like you mentioned, maybe I'm going to buy a company with new products. So that increases my value chain, right? Because I'm expanding my product line. Or let's look at distribution. Let's say I don't have a trucking company, okay, and I buy a trunk, truck, trucking company. I'm moving up my value chain now, right? Because before I didn't have distribution, now I do have distribution. Uh, does anybody have any other examples of value chain? How you can move up and down that value chain? Um, I was thinking of like, can uh, raw materials be part of the value chain? Oh, definitely, yeah. Uh, like I was thinking, like um, like the amount of raw material is increased, then then more goods are produced, and that means like more uh, goods are sold. Yes, yes, that's definitely that's another one too for sure. But um, for the purposes of this course, just know what the value chain is. I mean, sequence of business functions, and. Um, we're not going to go into too much detail, but now let's talk about supply chain management. Now, integration of supply chains has increased with technology. It's increased with global markets. You can see many companies using parts from all over the world. Downside, political change may impact supply chains. It takes years to build up a supply chain. So breaking them can be very costly. So what is, um, what, what events are we going through right now that may be impacting supply chain management? Uh, this is Paul. So the events would be the uh, trade wars uh, that are happening between countries. So 
would like what Trump and China are going through? Is that a good example? Yes, because China is a major uh, major chain in the trade, and yeah, absolutely. I think you know what uh, I mean. So all these car manufacturers or parts manufacturers, they're importing part of their supply chain is importing products from China, and now yes, now Trump is trying. You know, let's build from home. And that's impacting the supply chain, but you can't do it overnight. You can't all of a sudden switch. Oh, let's just switch a supply chain back to made in America or made in Canada. But, but also not only that, but it's that's like, I mean. uh, sorry to interrupt, but not only that, but uh, even bringing it back, the costs are going to increase and ultimately the businesses are going to be less profitable than they were before because yeah, they were also taking right, advantage Paul. of the uh, exchange rates. Oh yeah. And that too. Absolutely. Now, Jill brought up a good one. How about uh, the pandemic, COVID-19? How's that impacting the supply chains? It must have a major impact on the supply chains in the way many companies are running. Anyway, something to think about. Again, for this course, just know what supply chain management is, um, integration coordination of activities, and like, um, Paul mentioned, um, aim, aim to reduce costs and improve reliability. So that's what supply chain management is all about. And that's all impacted by COVID, exchange rates, international trade agreements. I mean, the list is endless. Um, so key success factors. Um, they're part of the strategic planning process. Who can give me an example of a key success factor? Generally, when a company is setting up a strategic plan, they'll list, they'll list key success factors. It's usually between three and five broad categories. Who can give me one example of a key success factor? Financial or otherwise, that a company may have. Sales, definitely. I want to reach my earnings per share at $5 per share. They could have that as a key success factor. Marketing, absolutely. Market share, that's a good one. Yeah, 50% market share in the production of hats. Customer bees. Sorry? I said customer bees in the markets. Oh, I didn't quite catch, uh, say that again. Did somebody Yeah, I that? said the uh, customer base in the market, like um, if you are trying to acquire the, a certain percentage of uh, the customer in the market compared uh -huh. to your competitors. Oh, definitely. That could be KSF for sure. Um, increase in share value, reputation. Sean, reputation, how would you measure reputation? A good thing about key success factors we should try to make them measurable. So if I was to re measure reputation, what would be a measure I could use of reputation? Peter, low price through economies of scale. Yes, absolutely. So going back, how would I measure reputation? Anybody have any ideas? Customer relations. How would I measure customer relations? Uh, one way is surveys, um, random surveys yep. or uh, given out on the internet or just have uh, customers coming in, not customers, but you pay people to come in to do um, a check. You know, they hire people for these things nowadays. For yeah, they've got time. these uh, shoppers. Sometimes they, they go mystery shoppers. They'll, yeah. they'll go into stores and do surveys and what have you, definitely. How about customer churn? They keep, uh, how many customers are, how many customers are you adding? how many customers you're dropping. That would be something that may impact your reputation. Um, okay, let's go to the five steps decision-making. Um, identify the problem, obtain the information, make the prediction. Um, usually you'll have four or five alternatives. Usually you'll crunch some numbers for those alternatives. You'll state the advantages, the disadvantages, the pros and cons. Oh, did somebody have a question? Um, so alternatives, pros and cons, then you evaluate and you make a recommendation. 
So again, basic five-step decision-making process. Again, for this purposes of this course, we're going to be not necessarily doing too much alternatives. We're going to be doing the predictions or the calculations or the analysis. Uh, management accounting, the key guidelines and roles. Um, this is cost benefit approach is similar for you finance people. How many people here have done capital budgeting? So anybody here, capital budgeting or net present value? Yes, I have, Carla has, Tulupe has. So cost benefit is basically a similar approach. You're basically taking your net benefits or your costs. Um, it's always more advantageous to use a time value of money. So basically it's capital budgeting or net present value analysis. Um, behavioral and technical considerations. Again, the roles of groups within organizations. Um, so when you look at management accounts, they're usually on the finance side, they're the controllers or the divisional controllers of the company. Those are basically your management accounts. Um, I think we talked about ethical and government regulations that every company must adhere to. You've got government regulations regulations, corporate code of conducts, whistleblower policies. We talked about COVID-19, which is now impacting a lot of the governments and regulation. Regulations are being changed overnight. A good example is the school boards. They have to reintroduce entry plans for students, safety protocols, wearing masks, distancing. This is all impacting um, social responsibility and regulations within not only the school boards, um, the hospitals, and many other organizations. Um, restaurants, you name it, every, every organization is being impacted right now with COVID. Finally, professional code of conduct. Now, this is interesting. Code of conduct and ethical um, conduct is an interesting topic. It's not as straightforward as some people like to think. Um, so code of conducts intertwined between the company you work for, the associations that you're involved with, along with your personal code of ethics. So this brings forth challenges for many companies because the decision is what is the correct code of conduct? Your personal code of conduct may conflict with your company code of conduct. Or your company code of conduct may conflict against your cultural code of conduct. One culture's code of conduct or what they deem as ethical is different than another culture's ethical conduct. So this is a major challenge globally and internationally. So something to keep in mind. So, And that's it for chapter one that I have for slides. Let's flip over to chapter two. We're at seven o'clock here. So I'm going to quickly, I want to quickly flip through chapter two here. Just give me a sec here. I'm looking for chapter two.
There we go. Can anyone see that now? Yes. Okay, good. So let's just fly by this. I mean, running out, we're at 705 right now. So cost terms. Um, so basically, we've got various cost terms. They're management account, accounting specific, um, direct materials, manufacturing overhead, what's conversion costs, what are prime costs, and so on and so forth. You guys need to get the foundation of what these, what the terminology is. As we move along the chapters, you'll see this, these different classification of costs pop up. And um, if you don't know what the classifications are or what it means, you're gonna have problems calculating or separating the correct cost. So it's very important that you get the knowledge of what the cost terms are. So we're basically gonna talk about what's a direct cost, what's an indirect cost, what are prime costs. Um, contribution margin analysis talks about fixed and variable costs. Um, so we'll quickly run through those. Um, what, what's fixed costs? What's fixed costs per unit? What's fixed costs over a relevant range? Um, we'll apply that cost information. Um, we're gonna do a gap income statement and then we're gonna compare it to a contribution margin statement, which is basically broken down by fixed costs and variable costs. And then again, the identification and classification of those costs. So what's a cost? Basically, a cost is you're sacrificing something. It's usually monetary in value. It could be if you had a barter economy, you could trade in a cow for, and it could be a cost. Regardless, it's something sacrificed. A cost object is grouping those costs. So cost object and they're similar costs. When you group a bunch of costs that are similar, it's basically called a cost object. So it could be a product, could be a machine. Um, basically it's numbers or um, costs that are accumulated within a group. We'll talk about these. You won't see this terminology too much. You will see cost pools when we do support costs in chapter nine and joint product costs in chapter eight. Um, again, you'll see cost assignment as well when we do support costs. So, I mean, basically cost assignment is linking to the cost pool. Um, cost pools are, again, another way of classifying similar like costs. Once we go through the problems, you'll start understanding. But like I said, we're not gonna see too much of these three categories till much later in the course. So what's a direct cost? Can somebody give me an example of what they might think a direct cost is? Um, I'm just guessing here. Would it be like a door for a new house, maybe? Yeah, that like would the be cost a direct of... cost. Oh, okay. Uh, so you know this. But you know what? What's a better direct cost is the actual wood that made that door. Okay. Because the door's also got a door handle. So that door handle... I, I, I would add a direct cost, but not so, necessarily. So go ahead. Sorry, I would just add that basically a direct cost is anything that you can um, track to a particular uh, product or, or a purchase or something. And indirect would be like you buy a bunch of materials and they're used yeah. for different products uh, to make different various products. That would be indirect cost for me. Yeah. Basically, so I mean, you, you hit the key, you hit the key word, traceable. So when you look at the product, you can see what in the direct cost mix it up, right? But it's not necessarily looking at it, but it's traceable would be the best explanation. So another example is, is de depreciation on a factory. Is that directly traceable to the product or is that more difficult to trace? That's traceable because it's uh, like it's for that particular product. Um, it is, but it's not directly traceable in some cases. It, it's not it's directly traceable. Depreciation, you're talking about. depreciation is not directly traceable because um, 
you cannot it does not involve in um, the actual man, the actual manufacture of the product yeah we can say depreciation is like um, maybe yeah. like an overhead cost because it's going to be spread if it's have to do with factory depreciation then it has to be spread among the product that is produced sorry i just added that i take my answer back it's not uh, you can't really it's a you're using a formula to base uh, what the depreciation might be so it's like almost like do, doing an appraisal so it's you can't really do a direct cost to it yeah, a good example is let's say I am in a warehouse and I've got depreciation on the warehouse. So how do I apply that depreciation in the warehouse to my product? And like the previous person mentioned, you probably have to do some sort of allocation, right? So in that case, it's not necessarily directly traceable, but we'll go through some examples. And, you know, it's not cut and dried. It's not black and white either. So, so in a lot of cases, but for direct materials, it's pretty straightforward. You've got direct labor, that's pretty straightforward. When it starts getting into manufacturing overhead, that's where we start getting into more estimations and allocations and what have you. And that brings us to indirect costs. Indirect costs cannot be traced to the cost object directly. A good example is the electricity to run a factory. Um, so here's some examples, and we just spoke about it, direct material. So you've got raw materials, freight, freight in, custom duties, um, direct ma manufacturing labor. You also have non-direct manufacturing labor. So there's some examples you can go through. Now here's some indirect cost examples. Fringe benefits. How do you, how do you allocate that directly? You can't. Overtime, idle time is another good one. Um, another good one is theft and, um, I forget the other one. Theft and there's another one, forgot the name of it. I haven't worked in a manufacturing environment in a long time. And then indirect manufacturing overhead. Again, you've got supplies, lubricants, and a whole bunch of others that can't be tracked directly to the product. It's more part of the factory cost, again, you have to think about allocation. And we'll talk about allocation methods. There's um, predetermined overhead rates that you allocate manufacturing overhead. Before you even start the manufacturing process, you'll establish a predetermined overhead rate for your manufacturing overhead. And then at the end, when the product's complete, you will have the actual overhead cost and you make a comparison. So that's chapter five, job order costing. We also have normal costing. We'll be talking about that in future chapters. Prime and conversion costs. Who could tell me what a prime cost is? Again, direct costs, the direct material cost, your direct labor costs, those are your prime costs. Now, who can tell me what conversion costs are? Paul, do you know what a conversion cost is? Um, from what I mean, indirect costs. Generally. Yeah, indirect, indirect labor costs and the overhead that convert those costs. Okay. And then we've got two very important costs for this course. You're going to see this in every chapter, fixed and variable costs. What are the main differences between management accounting and financial account. So variable costs, they change in proportion to the quantity or your activity level, while fixed costs remain unchanged despite changes in your output. So who can answer this question? Let's say I've got variable costs, I've got production, let's say the relevant range is 500 to 1500 units. So I increase, my variable costs increase between that relevant range. I produce from 500 to 1,500 units. So what are my variable costs per unit within that relevant range? Do they remain the same or do they change per unit? Variable costs will change 
per unit. So you say they change per unit? Yes. So if I go to 1500, my variable cost is going to be $15 per unit. If I go to 500 unit production, it'll be something like $5 per unit. Um, no, I think they will say unchanged since it's, I don't know, since it's the per unit is like the same, it's like saying like, if you're doing it for $16 an hour. Oh, mm. that's close. So who's that? What's, what's your name? Oh, you. Rachel. So Rachel, okay. I'm not sure though. I don't know. I'm gonna I'm gonna agree with the first person there that the depending on like as you increase units as you decrease units your variable the variable cost changes. So uh, I'm gonna make one caveat though that 500 to 1500 is it's got a linear relationship. So it's in the relevant range and it's linear. Does that change your opinion, Paul? You still think the variable cost per unit changes? Yeah, maybe I didn't get your answer very well, but um, if we're looking at the units for variable cost, it will remain the same thing. But um, uh -huh. if you're looking at uh, maybe the total, you know, like we're looking at uh, the variable cost in terms of TVC, uh -huh. so it increases as, as your activities or the production increases. But if it's unit, the units remain the same. Right. So does that change your opinion, Paul? Or do you still think you know, cost? I think I, linear, okay. Uh, is that just the upward line? Like, um, it's right a now? straight linear line. So, so and that's the assumption. So let's, okay. So let's look at fixed costs. So do fixed costs per unit remain the same over 500 to 1500 units or do they change? Remain the same. They remain the same. No, fixed cost per unit will change. Unit. No, it changes. Fixed cost per unit will change. And the same thing with the total cost. Right. I agree with you. Per unit, the fixed cost is going to change as you increase your production, if it's a linear relationship. Anyways, here it is summarized. So variable costs change in proportion with output, more output, more cost. That's in total dollars. But the cost per unit unchanged in relation to output. Assuming you're in a relevant range and the relationship is linear. I mean, in reality, the relationship's never linear. It is in a certain range, and then it starts curving inwards and outwards. If you, well, I'll show you a graph regardless. And then fixed costs unchanged in relation to output. So in total dollars, you increase the output fixed cost is the same. But per unit, more output equals lower cost per unit. So I just want to make it clear when you guys are looking at the fixed cost and variable cost, because some students get confused. So is everyone clear now on that relationship? So yes. let's look at it. Yes. So here's your variable cost behavior. So yeah, it increases, but on a per unit basis, it's gonna be the same. Your fixed cost is basically flat in total dollars. So here's the assumptions to remember. Costs are defined as variable fixed, time horizon must be specified, the relevant range. So basically your total cost or your, all your variable costs plus all your fixed costs in this case, there's only one cost driver. There could be, there's, I mean, there's multiple cost drivers for costs. So this is your basic linear formula. So variable costs, you can have an activity portion here, right? You can have your per unit cost times your volume, and then your flip fixed cost is generally just a lump sum. So we talked about relevant range, Basically, the relevant range is output where cost and its cost driver is valid. So in this case, we've got total fixed costs and the miles of fallen. It seems to be only relevant between 120,000 to 240,000. So for the purposes of 99% of the questions you're gonna do in this course, it's gonna be falling within the relevant range.
Um, unit costs are an average. Okay, I think we talked about this a bit. Um, yes. So economies of scale. So as you scale your productions, your fixed costs generally remain the same. So as you increase your activity, your average cost goes down. So basic economics, law of diminishing returns. So you're scaling your product. That's called operating leverage. We'll talk about operating leverage next week, actually. So this is what they're talking about. And just a graph to give you some examples. Well, here's what we talked about. So this is a good example. They talk about BMWs here. So you've got a BMW, the direct cost, tires used in assembly of an automobile. So they've got it as a variable cost. They've got it as a direct cost. So when you look at a car, you can see the tires. So it's easily traceable. Now let's look at the indirect cost. Power costs at the Spartanburg plant. Power usage is metered. So hard to identify, hard to see. That's an indirect cost, but it's still a variable cost. Power cost will increase as your activity levels generally increase. Um, fixed costs, salary of a supervisor at the BMW plant. Um, identified as a fixed cost and a direct cost. Why is it a direct cost? Because he's on the assembly line. So he's, although you can't see the supervisor on top of the BMW, he's directly involved in the production of that car. But if you're a vice president of marketing at the corporate head office, <clears throat> that definitely wouldn't be a direct cost. So anybody, assembly line supervisor, production supervisor, production manager, that's a direct cost. So, and it's a fixed cost. And finally, we've got the annual lease cost of a Spartanburg plant. Leases for the whole plant where multiple products are produced, indirect cost, but lease cost is a fixed cost. It's a flat charge per month. So does that make sense? How they've um, basically the separation between direct cost, indirect cost, and then how it fits between variable cost and fixed cost. Okay, um, period costs. Period costs, good example. Expenses on your financial statement or your income statement. Those are period costs. You're matching your revenue to your expenses. That's a period cost. Now, a product cost is basically your holding cost. So companies are holding inventory, whether they're using FIFO or LIFO. When you hold inventory, you've got product costs or inventoryable costs. Again, just know what a period cost is. You're gonna be seeing plenty of product costs and analysis in this course. Um, around chapters, I think it's chapters six and seven. But here, I love this chart. So this chart basically explains the flow within a manufacturing company. So you've got your product costs. Now product costs are in your inventory. They're made up of your direct materials, your direct labor, indirect manufacturing overhead costs. So if you look at your balance sheet, your direct materials are your materials inventory, and then you've got a work in process account. That's on your balance sheet. Eventually, now you're gonna have opening and ending inventories here as well. Goes to your finished goods, opening and ending in the finished goods. And that's how it flows through your income statement. Your finished goods is your cost of goods sold. And you also have cost of goods manufactured. Cost of goods manufactured is in between work in process and finished goods. So cost of goods manufactured is in here. And we'll go through a cost of goods manufactured statement. So again, we'll, we'll discuss the flow of, hopefully do an example today that'll show you cost of goods manufactured and cost of goods sold. Um, I'm gonna quickly, yeah, let's go through this right here. So quickly, first of all, does this look familiar to most everybody? Are you guys comfortable? This yes. is an income statement. Yes. 
So here's your cost of goods sold. So you've got your beginning finished goods inventory. Now, you, your inflow is your cost of goods manufactured. It's coming in. That's your cost of goods available, less your ending gives your cost of goods sold. Now, where am I getting my cost of goods manufactured? Let's go to the next slide. So your cost of goods manufactured is, you've got your direct materials, beginning inventory, you purchase some materials, then you got some materials available, less your ending inventory, you got your direct materials used, then you got your direct manufacturing labor, then you got all your overhead costs. That's your total manufacturing overhead. You add these three up. Here's your total manufacturing costs. Now we're going into work in process. Beginning work in process, total manufacturing cost. Here's your cost of goods manufacturing. So we're going to be going over this in chapter five, chapter six. Chapter five is job costing. Chapter six is process costing. You'll need to know, we're going to get into some details on how to do this cost of goods manufacturing. Um, but see how that 104 flows back up to here, the 104 in your income statement. And again, remember when I spoke about the relationship between management accounting statements and financial accounting statements. They are interlinked. So management accounting is not pulling numbers out of nowhere. So this is management accounting here, tracking your labor, tracking your direct materials, tracking your work in process. And then eventually it's gonna flow into your income state. Um, measuring labor costs. So again, we've got indirect labor, then we got direct manufacturing labor. And I'm gonna basically end it right there. So where are we at? 727, I didn't wanna take that much time on these slides. So let's take a 10 minute break. So let's come back, where are we at now? 727, um, is 10 minutes long enough for you guys? Does that work? Yeah, it works. Yeah. Okay, good, grab a coffee, grab some chips, and we're gonna dive into some problems. We're gonna do some short, quick ones, and then maybe we'll do some little long ones as you guys get comfortable. Okay? So see you guys in 10 minutes. Okay. Thank you.
So what I've got posted here is some quick um, true, false, and multiple choice questions for chapter one. Um, is everybody back? I'm back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm back. Good. So what we're going to do here, um, so I'm looking for some help from all you, from everybody in the class. And let's just run through and see if we can nail down some of these questions. So let's start. Hey, before I begin, can everybody read this a little bit bigger? Is that better? Okay. Uh, yep, that's better. It's good now. That's good now. That's good? It's good. good. Okay. So here's question one. Organizational core competencies refer to purpose or ideology that guides the organization's overall direction and its approach regarding various stakeholder groups. Now, this is part of a strategic planning process. Is that true or false? Are core false. competencies the ide ideology that guides the organization? True or false? False. False. I got two falses. True. It's true. Okay, here, let me, let me, let's keep track. False, true. So I got one true and two falses. Anybody else? True. So you got you got two true. Now it's three. I got three three falses. Okay. No, three true. Three true. Uh, yeah. Really? I, I thought I had three falses. <laughs> no, I said true. Someone is. I said true as well. Okay, two. True. Another true. Three. Mm -hmm. Okay, who said false? I said false. Okay, got one false. Anybody else? False. False. Two false. Anybody else? Let me check my uh, chat here. Is anybody texting me? Let's see here. There's no chat. Here we go. Uh, Serena says false. True, true. We're pretty split here. I will say false, too. Oh, good. Got another false. Okay, three, three. Ah, we got another false, another false, four. All right, let's see. I'm guessing it's false. Core competencies fall under your vision statement. Yes. So when you do a mission or vision, statement, that's your overall purpose or ideology. Core competencies yeah. are what you're good at. Let's see what it is here. I think I got it hidden. And it's false. So does that make sense? Yeah. It's a matter, read over the strategic plan, read over the definition of a core competency. Because your core competency isn't your purpose or ideology. It supports your mission and vision statement. Yeah. Does that make sense? Okay, let's try this one. Organizational strategies are the tactics the managers use to take advantage take advantage of core competencies while working toward the organizational vision. So we no. just talked about it. So true or okay, I'm gonna start true or false. True. 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 Uh, true, true. True. True, true, true. I think I think it's obvious. It's true. I'm guessing it's true. And it is true. Good. Management control systems include planning, monitoring, motivating, controlling, and measuring performance. Hmm. True or false? True. Uh, true. 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 Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Pretty sure it's true. Let's unhide. It is true. Good. Financial accounting is a process of gathering, summarizing, and reporting False. financial and non-financial information. False. 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 You guys are all good management accountants. I like it. Definitely should be false. Unless Wiley's on drugs or something here. Okay. Budgets quantify the qu the planning process. True or true. false? True. True. Yeah, true. That's true. I would agree with you guys. 
True, good. Relevant cash flows are cash flows that occur under one course of action or decision alternative, but not under another. True. 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 I think I agree with you guys. Let's see. True, good. <clears throat> Management accountants are responsible for addressing business risk, taking calculated risk across the enterprise, appropriately manu managing and mitigating the risks. Hmm. True or false? That's true. That's true, yes. I think it's true too. Yeah. Let's check it out. No. Oh. False. Management accountants are responsible for addressing business risk, taking calculated risk across the enterprise, and appropriately managing and mitigating the risk. Oh, no, that's false. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> so why is it false? So management think... accountants don't address business risk, they calculate risk across the enterprise. Is it, is it because they're, they're like a management, you know, management, management accountants? accountants are not in that accountants position. rather than uh, manager, I'm sorry, uh, CEOs or something like that? It would be more of a, that would be more at a, like a CEO level or like a management account wouldn't be, yeah, no. I think they don't mitigate the risk, the risk for the benefit of the stakeholders. Right. Managing accountants don't mitigate risk for the benefit of stakeholders. They mitigate risk for the benefit of the organization. Right, correct. Yeah, I agree. So we should have read that more carefully. All right, biases are systematic distortions in judgment. Hmm. That's true. That's true. I think that's true. Okay, this better be true. Because I think it's true. Check this out. True. Okay, good. Diagnostic diagnostic control systems establish limits on individual behavior. True or false? I'd say false. False? Okay, let's, let's take a, got one false. Any, any true? False? False. Got three falses. Hmm, let's see what it is. I think it's false. False it is, good. Um, biases may sometimes prevent the identification of an ethical problem. True. True. That's true. Yeah, I think it's true too. Check it out. True. Okay, let's do some multiple choice here. Which of the following is not an organizational stakeholder? Owners, donors, employees, management. Donors. 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 Sorry, donors. 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 I think their donors are probably more external. Let's just check this one out. I don't. Oh, management. Interesting. Sorry, what? What? Management is not an organizational not stakeholder. An Gosh. organizational stakeholder. So stakeholder is definitely an owner. Oh, I guess owners so. are not. Are they yeah. stakeholders? I don't know if I agree with this one. Because the yeah, management. I don't, I don't know if I agree with that one. Because the, the function of the management is to protect the interests of oh, all the stakeholders. Oh. Like the right. no, but they are part of us. They are all they are oh, a stakeholder so as well, that. part of the no, organization. No, no, they are, they are not a stakeholder. The management is not a stakeholder. They are protecting the stakeholders. Yeah, they protect the employee. So, but how, do, how is the donor a stakeholder? No, donors. The donors the stakeholder because you know they contribute towards your business, and if you do something contrary, they can withhold their fund. So they are part of the stakeholder. Ah, yeah. Okay, you make it. Then a donor, then a, a donor is a stakeholder. Oh, so, yeah. okay, that makes sense. Thanks. So that's a bit of a tricky question, actually. Let's let's go through this one. Which of the following is not a long-term decision that is guided by strategies? Okay, financing debt and equity, types of goods and services offered, 
whether to hire a specific employee. T. Investments in property, plant, and equipment. Okay. I think. Did I hear a D? No, C. C, C. C, another C. Anybody else? No, C, I think. Another C? Yeah, C. Yeah, it's okay. C, yeah. Okay, let's see. Take a seat. It better be C. <laughs> yeah, let's just check this out. It is C. Good. <laughs> Which of the following is an example of an operating plan for Netflix? Oh, okay. Extensive database, customer movie preference data, randomly testing customer service levels, acquiring 100,000 movie titles, developing and maintaining a website. Hmm. Mm. Mm. Operating plan. So operating. I'd say A. I say extensive database. No. Oh, no. I would uh, say maybe B. like B. Yeah, B. B. No, B cannot be operating say... and development. Do I have a B here? B. I have a B, but I'm not sure. You C? Yeah, I think I kind of feel like C. So I've got a C and a B. Operating. If it's if it's operating, it has to be like a continuous something. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so acquiring. So, B, movie, so we have to be C. D. It may not be C. If it's, yeah. If it's if it's Netflix, if it's if you are talking about Netflix, they yeah. I think it's acquiring movie titles to satisfy the uh yeah, but if it's operating, yeah. you know. Yeah, I think C if, could be if it's I an operating plan, customers acquiring movie is not is like is it looks like a strategic, you know, when you mm. acquire one thousand movies. If it's operating, something you have to be doing. But yeah, you're you know, doing constantly, right? You're yeah, that's what I'm looking at. Mm. Yeah, this one's a tough one. So maybe 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 so. Oh, it can be D or I don't know. Maybe D. I don't know. I yeah, because D. because they have to constantly maintain their website. Yeah, to a subscription it, sign. Yeah. Up. Yeah, sign up. Yeah, oh, because, because yeah. Yeah. developing and maintaining D. Yeah. Yeah. D, yeah. Yeah. To be D. Yeah, it could like um attract customers to sign up and watch new movies. Yeah, because I you changed know, mine. Yeah, I think D. Though. D. <laughs> Let's look at D. Let's look at the answer. Yeah, well, so, you, know what, you know what? This was kind of tricky. Your guess is yeah. mine, so let's see what it is. B. B. Oh, B. I told. Oh, I told, I told you originally. Testing <laughs> customer service there. Well, maybe the key is randomly, but I don't know. Well, it could be part of QA, right? So it's constant. If it's constantly being done, I feel like I don't know. That's I don't uh, know. randomly is. Uh, I don't know. Yeah. Is also a Sorry, maybe I didn't understand the question. So, the which of the following is an example of operating plan mm -hmm. for Netflix? So specifically, what does that actually mean? Uh, I think testing customer service level is just trying to see what appeals to each customer and then tailoring their movie titles, their movies to what the customers want to see. Or it could be that they have complaints and then they check uh, customer satisfaction polls or something like that. So that could be part of just like overall operational. I don't know. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I think because you know it's randomly That's testing. Right. So this this is a plan, and I think this may be like a complaint from the customer. So they have this as, you know, this is what they want to do, and then um, so they want to randomly test. Uh, you know, just to find out, oh, the customers are okay. So it's something they will con they are going to be doing. I don't know. But since it's a plan, you know, it's not like something that they are doing. Like D, D is developing and maintaining websites. So that one D is a continuous something, something they've been doing. Right. But right. I think B also, it is a research and development activity for me. Oh. Than, uh, than operating activity. But it's like the difference between operating and like just short term, right? So if you have like um, like a project, which is just like you do something, you launch it, and then that's that. Like customer service is a constant, ongoing thing, right? Yeah. So exactly. that's why I, that's that's where I was like, 
thinking it might that's the reason why it is but well, let's sure. go back to the textbook when you have a chance and get a clear definition of an operating plan and then maybe we can uh, nail this down so um is this okay. posted on, it's on page six page oh. six yes of the okay. textbook thank you Welcome. six mm, operating plan yeah it's on page six. Yeah. Yeah, so it's short term decisions. Oh, short term decisions. That shape and organic. So A is out. B is. Yeah, different. you can see that. You can see oh, that. Is there? Customer service levels. Yeah, oh, yeah, it is, it is one of the examples. Yeah, <laughs> randomly. Okay. <laughs> okay, we got it. It's right here. Yep. I Plus, need a textbook. Um, is this post? Uh, is this, uh, will this be posted on Moodle? Yes, I'm going to be posting this after a class in Moodle. Okay. Everyone, so go back to page six, it'll tell you. Okay, let's move on here. Okay, this one should be simple. Which of the following is not a role of management accounting? So gathering information for planning, information D. implementation. Uh, D. 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 It's D. D. I don't think there's too much controversy here. So. <laughs> no uh, controversy. D. He imagine you got it wrong. Okay, good. Yeah. <laughs> Process of strategic management as a part of the management control system occurs in what order? Okay, think this is basically your strategic plan. So, so what's the C. first step, the next step, the strategies, and so on and so C. forth? Mm -hmm. C. C. Yeah. C. D. C sounds better. It's D. Definitely C. We got a D as well. Management first. Yeah, it's okay. full sales management. I know you have to. C. You said the vision first. This is, my this is a C. You, you need to have a vision and then yeah. develop your core competencies and then from the core competencies, build you, strategies, you, you strategies and, and then your operating plan. Yeah, C. Yeah, C. 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 Oh, I think I was D. I think it's it. No, oh, just what I'm here. Oh, no. Okay. Because complete thing? vision is coming first. So I the think vision has to come first. The yeah. vision has to come first. That's the thing, first thing. Yeah. So I'm guessing it's C. Yeah. Let's see here. If I get this wrong. What's okay. C? It has to be C. C! Yes. 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 <laughs> I'm, I'm a management accountant. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's go. Feedback loop of the management control system includes which of the following? Measure performance, monitor progress, motivate employees, measure performance, monitor progress, set goals, monitor progress, set, or set goals, core competencies, or motivate employees, set organizational goals, create operating plans. I think the key is loop. What is the feedback loop? An A. So we got an A. That's it. So measure performance, monitor progress, and motivate employees. Hmm. Need more HR. Say A as well. Yeah, same here. A. A, baby. <laughs> <laughs> B. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> Let's see. Is it like a visual? We'll have to look. No, we go Excitement for Friday night. <laughs> it is a. Hey. Hey. Yeah. Oh, A. Hey. All right. Results achieved over a period of time are classified as results. Mm. No. Is there actual operation? Uh, actual operations. I yeah, guess. it looks actual, actual operations. Yeah, yeah, actual yeah, operations. Actual. Yeah. yeah, that's what I'm thinking. Let's see. Yep. Yeah. yeah. What are four levels of control used by managers to measure and monitor organizational performance and motivate employees to take actions? So again, go to your textbook and get the definition. So 
for four levers of control? It's C. Yeah, I go with C. It's C. C yeah. Mm -hmm. Let's check it out. Yeah. What is a lever of control that includes vision, mission, and core value statement? Belief. Oh, belief. Belief. belief system, belief. boundary system, diagnostic control no. system, interactive system. Hmm? That's Inter belief. That's We're done deep. with that one. <laughs> deep. Okay. We're belief system, deep. yes. Belief yeah. system, D. So interactive, B? This one? No, no, no. No, no, no. D, 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 which is a function of, which is not a function of a diagnostic control system. B. 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 Yes. Force employees. B. No force. <laughs> <laughs> B is right. B is. Okay. We're going to, I'll let you guys finish off the rest of these. Um, I'll send them off to you. Let's uh, go somewhere. Oh, wow. There's a lot of questions here. Okay. Jesus. Um, let's do something else here. What do we got here? Chapter one. I did want to go through this one. So this is your self-study problem, 1.1. One. Um, so basically, this is going to tell you how to do a traditional income statement and a contribution income statement. So everybody flip over to the self, what page is that on? The self-study program. Let me just see here. Self-study 1.1. Page 28. Yes. Oh, no. I think the answer is on page 28. I've got page... Uh, it's page 16. Page 16. <laughs> page 16. Do I need to make this bigger? Okay. Yes. yes. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Okay, so we've got microfan manufacturer produces, oh, that's model. Okay, model of mini fan sells for $9. Okay, so what I try to do with these problems, as soon as I see a number in the, in the paragraph, I separate it out. So mini fan, $9 per unit. And then we've got direct, direct labor workers are paid in hourly basis, work only when needed. Other manufacturing over costs do not vary in product, with production levels. Sounds like a fixed cost. Um, 50,000 fans are produced. So I put that down, 50,000 fans produced. And <clears throat> so we've got direct materials. Is that a dollar per unit? I think that's given. No, it's not given. Okay. So we've got direct materials, 50,000. Direct labor, 100,000. Supervisor salary, utilities, depreciation, other. Then you've got advertising, sales commission, and administration. So the required, prepare a traditional income statement, categorizes cost of goods sold. So this is your financial income statement. Prepare a variable cost income statement with product costs, separated, fixed, and variable. So that's your contribution margin statement. That's management accounting. And then he wants to estimate the next year operations if sales will increase 53,000 units. So what I like to do is let's do the per unit costs. We've got 50,000 units, direct materials divided by the units. So it's a dollar per unit or direct labor is $2 per unit. 
supervisor salary. So these are fixed. That's a fixed cost. Fixed cost. Fixed cost. Fixed cost. Um, sales commission, twenty thousand divided by. So that's a variable cost. That should be a fixed cost. That should be a fixed. Cost. So your variable costs, your sales commission, your direct labor is going to be a variable cost, direct material. So let's give, um, let's see what a traditional income statement looks like. So we've got, first we're going to do the cost of, um, we're going to do the cost of goods manufactured. Um, or maybe we should do the contribution margin statement first. Now let's do traditional. Okay. The so cost of goods manufactured. Start with the direct materials. So fifty thousand. We produced and sold fifty thousand. So we start with the purchases fifty thousand. There is no beginning or ending. They don't give the beginning or ending. So our direct materials used is basically 50,000. So you just grab that 50,000, put it down here. So now we've got another direct cost, so direct manufacturing labor. So it's calculated, it's 100,000. So 100,000 direct labor. Now we need to do our overhead. So we've got our manufacturing overhead. Again, indirect manufacturing overhead which is basically your fixed costs, basically all these four right here. So your total manufacturing overhead is 80,000. Total manufacturing costs. You've got your direct materials used, your direct labor, your total overhead, that's your total manufacturing costs. So what we're doing here is a cost of goods manufacturing state. So there is no beginning work in process. So we've got total of 230. There is no less ending work, no ending, nothing given. So that's your total cost of goods manufactured. So does that make sense? Any problems? You guys catching it? Yes. Yep. So refer to the textbook on the format. Now, when we get to chapter five, we are going to have ending inventory and we are going to have beginning inventory. So it's going to start getting a little more complicated. But for chapter one, basically, you just need to apply the numbers that are given to you. So now we need to transfer that cost of goods manufactured into our income statement. So income statement, now we're going to bring in our sales, right? So what are our sales? 450,000. So it's this times your unit, 450,000. There's your sales. Now, cost of goods sold. So beginning finished goods inventory. We don't have any beginning finished goods inventory or none's given. Your transfer in is your cost of goods and manufacture. You take your 230, you bring it down here. So now it's cost of goods available for sale. There is no ending finished goods. They don't give it to us. So that's essentially your cost of goods sold. Gross margin, sales plus your cost of goods sold. You could do a percentage if you want. Now we want our SG&A. So selling general and min expenses. So what do we got? We got our advertising, 30,000. Sales commission, 20,000. Administration, 115,000. Operating income, 55,000. So this is financial accounting. Yeah. COGM and Interesting. Any questions? Pretty pretty easy, right? Yeah. Good practice. practice. 
Okay. Anybody want to attempt to do the, uh, now let's do the contribution statement. So the only difference with contribution, we're going to be now accounting for variable costs and fixed costs. So we've identified them. So let's see what it looks like. So we're going to do a contribution income statement. The revenue is going to say the same. We should get the same number. Operating income, 55,000. We should get the same number. So what do we got? You take it, so your first step is your variable costs. So it's 50,000. 50,000 direct materials, right? Yeah, 100,000. Direct labor. Sales commissions is a variable cost. Mm -hmm. So our total variable cost, 170,000. Okay. So now here's our contribution margin. Revenue less your total variable cost. Hmm. Contribution hard margin is much higher than your gross margin. Gross margin is only 48%. Hmm. But now we do our fixed costs. So basically the difference is you're, you're tracking your fixed costs, you're tracking your variable costs. So you got your manufacturing overhead, 80,000. Where's your overhead? These should add up to 80,000. And notice supervisor salary, depreciation, other. These are basically your indirect costs, your manufacturing overhead. 80,000. Let's go 80,000, good. Then you do your selling and admin, your fixed costs again. So advertising is a fixed cost, 30,000. Sales commission is not, that's a variable. No. But your admin is a fixed cost. So. 145. Add those two up. Should be 145,000. 145,000. Your total fixed costs, 225. So your operating income is 55,000. So it's going to be the same as your traditional income statement. So memorize this in the back of your heads, this format, because you're gonna be using this in chapter five. Um, I can guarantee you I'm gonna ask this question in your quiz. So basically know the difference between a traditional income statement and a contribution income statement. Yeah. Make sense? And it's a matter of doing a few problems just to get the flow and where, where each is categorized, but here it's a little more, a lot more input, but a lot more simpler when there's no inventories. Okay, so I had a few more questions. Okay, we talked about vision, core competency, operating plans, so I'm going to let you guys go over this on your own time. List three types of internal reports. And maybe we'll do this one. List three types of, okay, let's quickly do this. What are, what are three types of internal reports that um, management accountants may use? Capital and then, What was that? Um. I don't know if it's support organization, uh, capital budgets. Yeah, okay, capital budgets, anybody else? Variance analysis. Variance analysis, yeah. Cash flow. What was that? A cash flow plan. Oh yeah, cash flow. Hmm. Cash flow could be down here too. Could be. Any others? Um, How about um, AR aging reports? Yeah. Counts payable. AP aging report, yeah. Any others? Customer mm -hmm. churn. Inventory report or inventory. Oh, yeah, that's a good one. Inventory report. Operating budget. Operating budget, good one. How about some external here? 
Uh, balance sheets, income statement, yeah. uh, report. Or balance sheets, good. Income statement. That's receivable. What was that? Accounts receivable. Oh, yeah. Yes. Here you are. Statement okay. of changes in equity. Anything, any other external reports? I mean, for sure, maybe, I don't know. The book says regu uh, regulatory reports. What kind of inventory reports? Uh, regulatory with the Ontario Securities Commission. Oh my God, you're really getting technical, okay. OSC inventory reports. That would be external. You're you're reporting to the uh, uh, um, Ontario Securities Commission, definitely. What about auditor's report? Auditor report. Good one. Um, auditing plan. The the notes to financial statement. I think it's the notes to financial statement. Sure. Um, bank governance, is that an external bank? <laughs> yeah, it could be, I think. Okay, let's see. We're close here. So, examples internal capital budgets. Good, somebody said that. Support strategies, master budget. Hmm. Operating budget, we got some of it. Variance reports. Good, somebody said that. Somebody said variance, you know, variance analysis. Good. Help with monitoring, blah, blah, good. Financial statements. Let's see, oh, tax returns. We forgot about that. That's a big one, tax returns. Okay, that's good. Um, what else do I have? We did the um, traditional. <clears throat> okay, so we never talked about relevant costs. I may come back to this. I, I did a problem on relevant costs. I don't know if we have time to go over it in this class. Definitely go over relevant costs. Basically, relevant costs are what costs should be included in analysis and what costs should not be included. Um, a good example is sunk cost. Does everybody know what sunk costs are? Yes, the costs that cannot be recovered. Exactly. So, it's in the past. Huh. So more than, there's a lot of times when you're doing analysis that they're not relevant to the decision you're making because you've already, they're sunk. And you can't change it. So what's another opportunity cost? Is that relevant cost? Sometimes the opportunity costs become relevant costs. So let, so that's problem 1.38. If we have time, we'll come back to this. It's a little lengthy here. 1.39, income statement. Oh, good. This is good practice again to do a contribution um, statement. So why don't you guys do this on your own time? <clears throat> the answer is on here as well. And 1.4. Oh, this is a good one. Yeah. Suppose you decide to start a new fast food restaurant. Describe your vision, general strategy. We, we'll come back to that. I want to get into some costs. So let's, um, so now we're into chapter two. Let's do some quick true and false for chapter two. All right, managers need to know how costs behave in order to estimate them at a given level of production. True or false? True. 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 I think it's true as well. Check this out. Good, one for one. Rent for manufacturing plant is both fixed and direct. Well, this sounds like a trick question. Go on. Wait. True or false? Uh, I'm gonna say false. Yeah, false. you can No, for me, it is true. Fixed. Direct, direct is fixed. Direct it's true. Not direct. It's true and can be manufacturing plants. So rent for no. manufacturing plant is both direct. fixed and direct. No, it is true. fixed but not direct, so it's false oh. because you cannot trace yeah. it to a particular product. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I'm leaning towards false too. Yeah. False. false. I think false. false. 
I say if you are producing one product. No. Mm -mm. Oh. Boom. It's false, yeah. Okay, tires for automobile are both variable and direct. True. True. Yeah. True. Yeah. The, BMW the tires. Yeah, we saw that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Unfair. Okay. Yeah. Unfair. Okay. Direct costs are always variable and direct costs are always fixed. Ooh, that's direct costs are always fixed. False. False. They're always variable and indirect costs are always fixed. And false. So we're, false. They should they say false. over the relevant range, anyways. Oh, it's um true what? if it's over the relevant range. Mm. It should be true. That's what I'm guessing, but they never say relevant range, right? So yeah. Let's see what they say here. Let's see. False. Boom. Yeah. Okay. Direct costs are always variable. Hmm. Not necessarily. Relevant range is a span of activity for a given cost object, where unit costs remain constant and variable costs per unit remain constant. True. We talked about this. Yes, true. Yeah, true. 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 Yeah. False. Mm. Relevant range for given cost object where unit fixed costs remain constant, the variable cost per unit remain constant. Well, variable cost per unit remain constant. Fixed yeah. costs do not remain constant. Yeah, fixed costs are not. Yeah, right, within a relevant range, right? Yeah, even over the relevant range, right? So as you increase your activity, your fixed costs change per unit. They don't remain constant. Uh, but here, it's not talking, it's only the Unit. variable cost. Oh, yes, you're right. Yeah, total. Yeah, that's where I got confused too. I'm looking, we missed the unit here. Yeah. Yeah. Wasn't that graph? Okay. Benefits we forego when we choose one alternative over the other. We just talked about this. I called opportunity. Alternative cost two. True. Yeah. Very good. Cost driver is some input activity that causes changes in total cost for a cost object. It's true. true. I think it's true too. It looks, uh, Let's see. Are we sure? Mm. Yeah. Engineers are the only ones that can develop cost estimates. Now that's the that's the funniest thing I ever heard. <laughs> yeah, the only qualifies it to be a false. More estimates than engineers. <laughs> false. Because of the Probably only. Probably false. false. <laughs> well, I hope there's no engineers in the house here. False. Oh. oh. Okay. High low method is a specific application of scatter plot method that uses the highest and lowest data points. And we're going to talk about high low. True. Method. True. Yeah. True. So make sure you guys know how to do a high-low method for the quiz next week. See. Um, 10. And the question, total cost, 7.5 is the variable cost per unit. True. Oh. True. true. I think it's true. Yeah. Oh. It's, still it's false? true. It's true. true. Yeah, when Q changes, though. Uh, okay. yeah, 7.15, right? And it's... Oops. Yeah. True. No problem. Yeah. Okay, let's do some multiple choice here. What time? We're at 820. We still got some time here. What is not a category of costs? Relevance, traceability, value, function. Which is not a category of costs? Mm -hmm. That's a weird question. Which is not Relevance. a category of Relevance, traceability, um, I think function. value. I'm going to say C. I'm looking at C. I'm looking at B. I don't know. The functions like A and B is definitely right. C and it's between C and D. Yeah, it's C, yeah, it's function, C. Let's see here. Oh, Ooh, D. D, yeah, I know, multi right traceability, yeah. Traceability oh, because what? if you look at question 10, 7.15 is if a Q is a function of self, that's what is going to determine the variable cost. 
So that's like a function. I guess trace, traceability is yeah. find the directory. Right? I know, we should go back to read the textbook on that one. Yeah. That's a weird question for us. The which is not a category of cost, right? I don't know. I don't know if I agree with that. Costs that do not differ between alternatives are what type of costs? Oh, you guys should be able to get this one. Costs that do not differ between alternatives uh, are what kind of costs? Irrelevant? Uh, sorry, Professor. Like, I don't believe anyone can turn to page 42. 42? 42? Yes. Mm -hmm. Concerning the question 11, right. page 42. Yeah. So we have relevance, behavior, traceability, and function. And uh -huh. the only thing that is missing there is value. So I'm not sure why. Let's, well, it is, okay. uh, so, it is yeah, value. So there's something wrong with this question then. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, it doesn't make sense. So it's it probably value. It is value, yeah. Age. See, that's a mistake. Page 42. Did it make sense to me? <laughs> Okay. I was about to change my whole mindset here. Wiley makes mistakes. <laughs> Very good. Thanks for that. Um, where were we? Oh, costs that do not differ between alternatives are what type of costs? Sounds like relevant. Relevance. Yeah. Irrelevant. Irrelevant costs. Irrelevant. Costs that do not differ. Costs that do not differ. Well, yeah, yeah it's irrelevant. Irrelevant. It, doesn't, it doesn't change. I don't know. I think it's B, but anyway, let's check it out. Oh, let's see. Oh. Yeah, because relevant they differ. So does not differ, that'd be, yeah. Right, it's right, right. Costs that do not differ would be irrelevant, of course. An activity such as putting tires on a bike wheels as part of the manufacturing process is an example of what? Direct costs. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Putting tires as part of the manufacturing. Mm. Well, that's tires. labor. You're putting the tires on. Mm -hmm. but so that's direct, direct labor, though. It has right? to be direct cost, right? Yes. Cost object. Yeah. What? It's in the book somewhere, but I don't, let me. An activity such as putting tires as part of the brand. As part of the manufacturing process. Hmm. What's the definition of cost object again? So cost object is like basically grouping similar costs together. Basically, that's the definition. Okay. Well, so putting sense. on the tires as part of the manufacturing process. I think that's what they're getting at this other, other costs as part of the manufacturing process. But that sounds like direct costs. If it has to do with uh, well, production, production of bicycle. Definition of cost. Well, I think if it wasn't a manufacturing about process, it'd be fine. So if anybody can find that direct uh, definition of a cost object, but I'm thinking it's like similar costs are lumped together in a cost object. Page 42, cost object. Yeah, page 42. Yeah, so. Classification of costs. Okay, a cost object is a thing or activity for which we measure costs. And it includes things as individual product, product line, project, customers, department, and even the entire company. It can also include activities such as putting tires on bike on oh. bike. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I knew I read it. That's so why I was like, page forty two. Uh that's uh, the third, no, the fourth paragraph on page forty two. Okay. It's right in the middle. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So all these questions on the Excel sheet, they're all in the textbook, correct? Yeah. Okay. Like, yeah, obviously they're pulling these directly from the textbook, yeah. Yeah, yeah. The, and the questions are in the textbook as well. These ones uh, are not. Uh, some of them, I'm not sure if all of them are. Sure. 
the first ones i don't think they are like the ones that we do here the ones that say like 1.1 1. 1, 1. point something then those are in the book but the rest these ones are not okay yeah. these yeah, are more practice mm -hmm. anyways let's uh, how much time we got here what are we at if the cost object is defined as an airline flight, the salary of the pilot would be considered what type of cost? We should get this. So cost object, airline flight, the salary of the pilot, of the pilot would be what type of cost? Direct cost. cost. Direct cost. Direct. Right. Yeah. If you don't have him, you're not flying. <laughs> <laughs> Costs are classified by behavior for which of the following applications? Classified by behavior. By behavior. Costs are classified by behavior for which of the following applications? Mm, I'm almost guessing it's D, but uh, anybody else? I don't know. No. Got nothing on this. Idea. Could be B too. Costs are classified by behavior. So, page 42. I'd say B. What does page 42 say? A. Really? Cost of yes. Cost of classified by behavior. So in page 42 yeah. is pretty important. So 42 is literally yeah, it's everything. very important. <laughs> <laughs> literally everything. It's like oh, I have yeah. not heard any other page except 42. There's a lot. Okay. How would direct labor be categorized? Well, it's a direct Variable and direct, variable and indirect. Direct labor. Um, I'd say variable and direct. It is variable and direct. Variable and direct. Page 43. <laughs> <laughs> is that by chance the answer of these questions? <laughs> yeah. How would valve caps for tires be categorized? Okay, you guys should get this one. So valve caps for tires. Variable and indirect. That's what I'm yeah. guessing. Yeah. D? Anybody else? D. I'd say D. D. I think it's D, but let's see. D. If the cost object is a unit of production, how would factory insurance be carried? Oh, fixed and indirect. I'm guessing B too. Fixed and indirect. Anybody else? B. B as well. B. <laughs> B. So I had to read okay. Okay. I will let you guys go through the rest of these. Obviously, you can find the answers pretty quick in the textbook too. So. Sorry, I am, might have been like out for lunch, but this Excel sheet is on Moodle or I can get it from Moodle? No, no, this is, um, this is my lesson basically. I've set this Oh, sorry, this is right? your lesson. So it's not something that we have access to. No, I will give it access. So I'm going to post this on Moodle after the lecture. The answer? Yeah, all the answers are here. And yeah. there's some more practice questions you guys should all be right. doing, So I have a question. Is there any way we could get the the more numerical exercises like the ones we were doing at the beginning beforehand so that we can like do it with you as you go along so it's a little bit easier or uh, mm, no but i've given you the questions in advance the thing so is what I'm, what I'm hoping you, that you guys do is you guys do the questions and then we go through it together then i give you the solutions out okay okay perfect so after this class, that assignment, like um, those assigned questions on that word, I'm going to send all the answers to those. So, and plus you got the answers to these when I post these as well. So, so I'm hoping you guys try the solutions instead of, I mean, try the questions instead of looking at the solutions. Because you, when you just look at the solutions, you, you're just memorizing, so. <laughs> You're posting Anyways, 1.4, we talked about, oh, let's do this one, cost classification. Now, I didn't post the answer for this one. I will post it later, but let's try to, 
Now there could be multiple answers for each of these. So classify each of the following cost items according to items in the following table. Yeah, as I said, costs can be classified more than one category. If you help select the cost type based on whether costs will increase substantially if a large number of stereo systems are produced. So these are stereo systems. Okay, so speaker. Is that a direct cost, indirect cost, variable cost, fixed cost, product cost, or theory cost? More than likely, you can have one for each of these pairs. That's a pair. You probably have one of each of these more for most of the cases. So that should so be speaker, like- Speaker, is that a direct cost or indirect cost? Indirect cost. Indirect. Indirect cost. Is that a variable cost or a fixed cost, the speaker? Fixed cost. Both. Think it's a fix? Yeah, both. Variable? Uh, the more you produce, let's, the more stereos you produce, aren't you going to have a speaker okay. for each of your stereos? Um, it's not like you're going to have a fixed pool of speakers. <laughs> Is it, doesn't it increase with? As your stereo systems, the more stereos you produce, the more stereos you produce, the more speakers you produce, right? Wait, so that means your fixed cost would go up? So isn't that a variable cost? How do you guys get a fixed cost for that? This is a variable cost. The guess. more servos you produce, will be the more speaker. That should be variable. But if some people, you guys agree it's a variable cost now, or do you think it's still it's a fixed cost? I was saying both, but yeah, variable cost. It's more a variable cost than a well. It's a variable. It no, I don't think it's, it. It, yeah. it cannot be fixed cost because um, it increases as the production of speaker increases. So fixed cost is constant, except if you are on the long run where you are you've occupied the space and you want to move, yeah. So I think this is variable cost. Yeah, I agree. It's a variable. Okay, variable cost. Variable. I still think it's an indirect cost too. Uh, it's uh, ah, it should be a direct a, cost. <laughs> it should be a direct cost. I think so too, yeah. Yeah, yeah it's yeah. direct, yeah. Okay, now, so we got variable. Now, is this a product cost or a period cost? Product, product cost. Product product cost. cost. Yeah. There we go. I agree with that one. Okay, what about advertising? Is that a direct cost or indirect? Indirect. Indirect, indirect cost. Very good. Peace cost. Peace cost. And, uh, and this period cost. All right, now we're getting it. We're on a roll here. Let's go. Okay. Design of LX stereo, direct or in indirect? Direct. Direct. Variable. Fix. Uh, it's fixed. It's fixed because it's, fixed. This, this is a design. Yeah. It is what it is, right? Fixed. Yeah, it's, it's one fixed. time. And yeah, then one product, time. Cost. product cost. Ah, oh, why period? Oh, yeah, because it's only for. You could capitalize that as a product cost. Yeah, it can yeah. be capitalized. Yeah. Mm. Could be both. I don't know. I, I'm guessing it could be both, but let's it go depends. with it's probably more product. But mm -hmm. it, it, it all depends. When they say product, Cost. Does it have to do with a particular product or yeah? If it's if, 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 stereo. yeah. You know what? It's pretty tricky. It could be both. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, sorry. Uh, refresh my. What's a period cost again? So period cost is basically like if you look at your expenses on your income statement, right. you're matching your expenses to your period. That's basically what a period cost is. A product cost is more if you're holding inventory you've got a product so basically so it's just it's literally a just a period cost yeah it is okay so that's like this design that's why i'm almost guessing is that a product uh, it could be it's more of a period cost if you think about it yeah it can be a period cost it because it's not be a product cost too because you could capitalize yeah because if you produce the products quarterly or yearly but you have one design for it so it becomes it depends on company yeah. policy and standard strategy strategy because i think under ifrs you can um, capitalize design right not only ifs and gap too so 
design, only certain design, um, only if the product comes into market, you can capitalize the design. Market, yeah. If it doesn't come into the market, you can't capitalize it. So that's, that's tricky. It, there's a lot of, you know, assumptions. <laughs> okay, what about a plant janitor? This this should be relatively easy. Indirect cost. Indirect cost. Indirect cost. Indirect cost. Yeah. Variable. Is. Variable. Okay, I don't know. Plant janitor, sure yeah. Mm, I don't know. I think that might be fair. It's fixed. It's fixed cost. Janitor, yeah. Think about it this way. Are you really going to need more janitors the more stereos you produce? Unless you no. open another warehouse. I think it's and fixed cost. capacity no, of the plant. Well, mostly they are paid per hour, so it's maybe variable. No, no it's still a fixed cost. It is fixed cost regardless. I'm leaning against fixed, but you know you can make an argument for you know you can argue <laughs> variable too. But it's not direct. I mean, let's face it. If I add more speakers on two stereos, do I need a janitor for every stereo? No, no, no that's why it's not okay. But would you have to clean more though if the more so product for period period right plant oh, yeah. yeah yeah yes. yep yes. depreciation direct or indirect indirect, indirect. Yeah, it, direct, so. it could be direct if but more than likely it's indirect um depreciation fixed or variable it's fixed, it's fixed. It's fixed. Line method or whatever and product or period. Yeah, it's period. The position is period. Yeah. Rent, direct or indirect? Direct. 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 Indirect. Who said direct? His rent is indirect. Indirect. Rent. 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 rent is fees and this period. Rent is period. 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 Good. Factory maintenance, direct or indirect? Indirect. Yeah. Indirect. Indirect. Fixed. 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 And it's products. Mm -hmm. No, it to be mm -hmm. because, period. No, because period. it doesn't go for this. Is going to stay in the manufacturer car. It doesn't go into the. Um, I almost think it's product yeah. because it's factory. It's as part of your overhead. Your overhead's going to be applied to your product. Yeah. Related to the maintenance. Of that. Okay. It could be period two. I'm leaning. My my preference would be product. If 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 it's his office maintenance, yeah, but if it's factory, it has to do is um product overhead. Factory related manufacturing. Manufacturing overhead, yeah. That's what I think. So and uh, another definition, like the difference, another difference that I saw about uh, the difference between product cost and period cost is that product cost are only incurred if the products are acquired or produced. And the period costs are associated with the passage of time. So that means if the cost, like if nothing is produced, you still incur the cost. So that's period. The maintenance also, yeah. So period. Yeah, so that maintenance. should be period. So that's why you're arguing that factory maintenance should be period. Yes. Regardless of how many products you're still going to maintain or do maintain. Exactly. You know what? It could be both. So, um, you know what? My, I'm almost leaning still product, but it could be period two. I guess you can make a good argument of it and it still be. Yes, there. you can. So, these aren't black and white. So, uh, just to let you guys know. So. I think I think you're right. I think that is product though. Uh, from page, uh, what is it? I'm just. It's 42? Product, 13, yeah. <laughs> You'll see when we do job costing in chapter five, then you'll, you guys, it'll click, so. Okay. Um, fact, assembly workers, direct or indirect? Direct. Direct uh, cost. Direct cost. Variable or fixed? Variable. No. Fixed workers. It's but think variable. about it. Uh, so directly related variable. Variable? Variable? Fixed cost. Is variable. Why do you think no, it's fixed? assembly cost. At is I think it's variable, yeah. Variable. It's variable. And it's product cost. Product and cost. Product cost. Yeah. Perfect. Okay, good. Um, high low method. I definitely want to do this. Because um this will be on your quiz next week.
for sure. Yay. Ah. Oh. <laughs> so, <laughs> so let's um, 841. If we don't get to it, I'm just going to quickly explain how it's done. For you guys practice, because this will be on your, definitely will be on the quiz next week. Okay. So, so basically, the way these questions are structured, they're going to give you some units produced, costs, could be direct labor, direct materials, or what have you. The way the high-low method works is you pick the lowest units produced and the highest units. <laughs> We had some interference there. Anyways, so lowest, highest, that's why it's called the high-low method. And the goal is to estimate your total costs. So your total costs are basically your total cost equation, fixed cost plus variable cost. So the way you do it, and then basically first you're going to calculate your variable cost per unit. In this case, it's $25 per unit. So the formula is right in here. So 7,500 divided by the 3,000, and then A18, which is the 5,000 divided by the A14. So that gets you to $25 per unit. So that's your variable cost. And then you plug in that $25 per unit in your total cost function. And eventually, you'll derive your fixed cost. So I don't know if I fully completed this one. So I got the 25 per unit total cost. This is basically what you should come out to when you guys do it. Your fixed cost is 125,000 per unit. And 25 is your variable cost. I remember this from the also management 2400. So maybe if you guys want to. I don't know if we have time today. We only got like five minutes left. I've got a couple of high-low methods here to practice. I think this one's a high-low method as well. Use um, this is this is the account method. Oh, this is account analysis. Develop a cost function from the accounting ref. Okay, so this is account analysis. So do some practice questions on the high-low method. I don't think we have time in this class to go over it. But um, high-low and also know the account analysis as well. Sorry, uh, quick question on that first question. Go ahead. Um, so when you were doing the linear equation there, am I correct in seeing that the fixed cost comes to zero in that uh, 2.26? Sorry, can you speak a little bit louder? I didn't quite catch your question. My apologies. Um, so am I correct to say that the fixed costs are zero in all of this? Because when I'm looking at your linear equation, uh, is that, am I seeing that? No, right? the fixed cost should be 125,000. This is a check. So I did a check to, uh, to come out with a zero, but the fixed cost is, this is the actual equation here. Your total cost should be 125,000 plus your 25 times X. Okay, because when I take the 25 times 5,000, I get 125. 25,000 times. So if I take, yes. Yeah. yeah, so 25,000 times five, how much is that? Equals 5,000. 125,000. Oh, right. So it is zero. So your fixed cost is zero, that's correct. Okay, thank you. Yep, sorry about that. Um, but we got another high-low method here, so do this one as well. This one's a little more intense. So definitely do these two problems before the uh, quiz next week. Now this one's also gonna talk about variable and mixed costs. And this will also show you, remember we're talking about variable costs and how they're um, basically constant within the relevant range. When you guys do the calculations, you'll see that here. And you're able to identify if it is a variable cost per unit. 
by just doing a per unit calculation. And then you do a per unit calculation here, you see how the numbers vary. No, then, come on, Toronto. So but that's a dead giveaway. If you're looking for a variable cost, you do a per unit cost. If it stays the same, you know right away it's a variable cost. So, and this will also, another high-low method is available here so you guys can practice. And finally, we didn't even get to regression analysis. So, does everybody remember their statistics courses? Oh, God. No. It's been a long time. Uh, Unfortunately. So there's a self-study problem on 2.2, which also gives you the answer. And I've all also put it here. Mm -hmm. So basically, you've got cost drivers, right? So each driver you want to, you're basically going to test it to see if it falls in that linear. You're, you're testing your variable cost. You're basically testing your variable cost, and you're testing your fixed cost. Fixed cost. It's the same thing. You've got a total cost equals variable cost, which is based on your number of units plus your fixed cost, right? Mm -hmm. So all you're doing is you're testing this total cost. So you run a regression analysis, and let's say you have one cost driver, which is one variable cost. You could have two cost drivers or three. Um, and each of them are trying to estimate a variable cost and a fixed cost. So that's multiple regression. So for the purposes of this course, all you need to know is to interpret the numbers. So when you run your um, regression analysis, you've got one cost driver, Basically, 55,000 in fixed cost. The T statistic is 2.44. The P is 0 0.08, your P statistic. Your adjusted R squared is 0 0.31. So number one, so the R squared basically measures your correlation. It's basically measuring, is that driver um, relevant to assembly time in this case? Mm -hmm. Is that driver relevant to assembly time? So R squared, 31%. That's low. So it's not correlated. It's very, the higher the R squared, the better correlation. So your cost driver for machine hours is 70% R squared. So much better. So machine hours is a me much better measure. So that's, so that's R. So are you clear that R squared is measuring the correlation of your coefficient, which is machine hours, labor hours, and assembly time. And then you've got um, the second test. I hear text questions. Okay, so any questions on R squared before I go on to T, T statistics? No. No, I want to. So do a few questions, do the self-study problem and, and oh. read over, there's a section on regression analysis, which will basically give you an, basically an explanation of interpreting T values, E values, and R squared. Now T values, the higher the T statistic, the more, I mean, the more relevant the equation, the better the equation. So if you've got a T statistic that's greater than two, that means the cost is not going to be zero. You're testing the hypothesis, probability of not equaling zero. That's what you're testing for the T statistic. Mm -hmm. So, and basically you're testing if it's not equal to zero. So that means it's going to be equal to 55,000, or it's going to be equal to 20,000 equal to 10,000, but it's not going to be equal to zero. So if you have a high T statistic, that means it's more, your, your, um, your numbers are more than likely going to be the numbers that you predicted. So if you predicted 55,000, 
and basically t statistic greater than two, greater than two on your t. And then p value, the lower the p value, more accurate your estimate for variable cost and fixed cost. So the higher the p-value, the less accurate is your um, coefficients that you're estimating. So you're, what you're estimating is your variable cost and your fixed cost based on the cost driver. So in this case, you've got nursery supply, manufacturers, planter tubs, each wooden planter requires about the same time of effort in labor and machinery. So the managers and supply want to improve the quality of their budgets. They've got three cost drivers for overhead. They've got assembly time, they've got labor hours, and they've got machine hours. So those are your cost drivers. And then they ran a regression analysis for each of the three possible cost drivers. So if you're looking at the stats, which one do you guys think is the best cost driver based on these numbers? Like I'm guessing it's machine hours because machine hours got a higher R squared. Um, the P value is very low and your T statistic is greater than two. So I would say machine hours is your best cost driver. Yeah, I agree. So I did a little summary here, and I think the textbook does the same. So T stat greater than two, and basically less probability not equal to zero. So the higher the T stat, the probability is it's not going to be equal to zero, which means it's going to be equal to the estimate that you that that you produced. And then all the P values are low except for this one. See, this is the problem with machine hours, though. They've got a problem because their p-value is high. It's 0.25. You got a 25% chance that the numbers are actually zero. So, so you got a bit of a problem with machine hours as well. But these are even worse because your R-squares are so low. So even with the high p-value, this one's probably still your best bet. Sir, I have a question. Yep. So let's say in this case, you have the labor and the machine intersets, and uh, it's just an as assumption. So let's say for the labor, the T yeah. stat is like four, yeah. and the P value is 0 0.01. Well and done. for the machine hours, the numbers are the same. Four, hold on, I'm gonna write this down. So four for the T, and then how much for the P value? Uh, like 0 0.46. Point zero zero four no six? zero point four six like the regular oh sorry zero point zero one zero point zero one zero one like that okay and the, for the machine hours let's say we have the same value so the t starts as three point one nine and the p value as zero point zero five so if you ask the question that which one is uh, the cost driver. Uh -huh. What do we pick? Because right now, um, like we went for the machine hours because the T starts and the P value are all accurate, like above three, right. like they have higher figures. Well, for I, the gap. I like the T value, it's over two. The R squared is very good. Well, not very good, but it's 70%. The only problem with this one is the P value is 25%. So this one, very low R squared, so that means a driver is only 46% of the time related to labor hours. Um, and then the P value, but the P values are very good. So that means you are gonna get numbers. The problem with your numbers is they're not really gonna be close to what the, var the variance in the numbers are gonna be high, the variability. No, um, but I think my question is, which one supersede? Is it the T stat or the P value when making a decision? T stat supersedes the P. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, the, the P value is a subset to the T stat, basically. But the P value is basically 
telling you if the T stat is correct, <laughs> or the, the value of the T stat. That's what it basically is telling you. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, you're right. So the higher the T value, you could say it takes precedent over the, the P value. Because the P value is measuring the T value, basically. And the R value is measuring the relationship between the cost driver and the labor hours. If I would put a precedence, I always look at the R squared first. Because I want the most accurate cost driver to, to whatever um, 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 variable I'm using. So this tells me I got the lowest variability. I, I will get the most accurate number, but I do have a risk that I may get a zero value 25% of the time, and I don't want a zero value. So, so it's a bit tricky. So I would recommend going through the self-study problem because it does go into good depth on, on some of this, and then read, I'll get the page numbers here, but read, there's a section on regression analysis here. Oh, here it is, page, appendix 2A, page 67. Appendix 2A, page 67. Make sure you guys read that. And again, all you're responsible for is interpretation. Okay, so let's briefly go over what to expect on quiz one. So let me just open a new. We're running a bit. You guys mind if we stay an extra five minutes here? Yeah, sure. Okay, so quiz one. I'm going to let you guys, what should you guys know for quiz one? Let me. The traditional income method, um, high-low method, or sorry, the traditional income statement, high-low method. Um, and then there was the margin, contribution margin, margin statement. Yeah, high-low method. And then you've got traditional income statement method. Contribution margin method, yep. And that includes what? Cost of goods manufactured. Know how to do that statement. Right. Which flows into your traditional income statement. And mm -hmm. the contribution margin method is basically what? Fixed cost, variable cost, right? High low method, regression analysis, regression, only interpretation interpretation, R squared, um, T value, E. Um, account analysis. This is estimating total cost function, which is variable costs, X plus fixed costs. So there's two ways you can do an account analysis. So go over the method in the textbook, or you can do high-low method. Um, you definitely be asked about high-low method. You may have to do an account analysis as well. Um, cost classifications. So know what direct materials are: direct labor, manufacturing overhead, indirect costs, direct costs. Um, what were the other ones? Period, product costs. What were some other ones? Uh, opportunity costs. You may see sunk costs. Um, strategic planning. Again, only high level. Know what a mission statement is. Core competency. Um, key success factors. What am I missing here? I'm missing something here. Mission statement, core competencies. Swap. Value chain? Ah, yeah. Good. <laughs> ah, value chain, supply chain. 
Uh, let me put summer here because I'm going to save this and do, you, do we need to know the five steps of decision making process? Say that again. The five steps of decision making process. Oh, definitely. Five steps. Oh. Decision making process. Uh, there was something about internal controls, um, diagnostic controls. Uh, the four levels of control. Yeah. Say that again. The four that's levers, the four of, levers control. of control. All oh, four levers of control, that's it. Yep. Four levers of control. Um, the five steps, uh, that's the third learning objective. Uh, in the slide. So if you guys go in the back of the chapters, you'll get a summary of your learning objectives. So L01, L02, L03. So um, page 73 for chapter two. Now, the only thing, you don't need to know learning curves. I'm not gonna test you. I'm not even interested in learning curves. So look at page um, 73. So we've got cost concepts, types of cost behavior. Then we got estimation techniques. We didn't talk about scatter plots. Um, high low method. That's the one you need to know how to calculate. Analysis at the account level, engineering estimate of costs. Just know what it is. There's also a calculation called two point method, which is actually very quick. So. And then estimating regression analysis, knowing those um, statistics. That's it for chapter, I think we've got them all here, so. Um, and how many questions did you say were gonna be there? It's gonna be between 10 and 15, 10 and 15 questions. Okay, thank you. And you said we only have 25 minutes for it? 8.25 to 8.50? Yeah. I mean, a lot of these, for this first quiz, there's not going to be that many calculation questions. So. So, I mean, the other ones should be quick, quick. They're going to be like qualitative. I mean, I can bet you right now, you, you're definitely going to have to do a traditional income statement, probably contribution margin, probably a high low, so. Yeah, Prof, do we have a trial version for the wheelie for some of us that have not gotten the test book and we've paid? We don't have anything to read. Well, you'll have this, what I'm going to send you. Okay, okay, that's fine. So this is going to be posted for you guys to review. So. Okay, thank you. And, and there's a couple of problems we haven't even gone over here, so you guys can practice. So, thank you. So you should have more than enough practice here to get you through till you guys get your textbooks. In, so. Okay, thank have you. you. If you look Amazon Prime, the book, you can see the pre, you can see the first chapter, even though like for free, you can see like a okay. preview of the book. So if you don't have it, you can at least access the first chapter Good. for free. If you just look it up, like uh, Google Kindle and the name of the book. Thanks for that. Don't forget it's an open book. So, so no worries there, it's an open book exam. But that's a double-edged sword. You don't want to be sitting there flipping through notes, and then you're going to be out of time, right? So. Yeah, it's too bad we ran out a little time. I wanted to go more into detail on some of the regression analysis, and I want to do a high-low method. We just ran out of time, so. Okay, um, that's all I had. Did anybody have any other questions? So um, we'll be posted under the uh, Lee number of lectures. Sorry? Say that again. Sorry, I didn't pick right. it up. Oh, I see my turn. Um, so one Pardon lectures. Me? Can you hear me? No, I can't. I can't. Let me just turn my volume up. I can't hear you. Your internet's breaking up. Yeah, you're breaking. Your internet's breaking. Uh, Am I breaking up? No, no. Uh, his is. Oh, is it Rafat or? Yeah. 
Um, so no, I, I was saying the recording will be posted under the week one lectures, correct? Oh, the actual recording? Yes. I okay. should have that posted to you this weekend, actually. So. Okay. Oh, good. Perfect. Thank but you. This, um, if not, you can have access to this lecture, this Excel spreadsheet that I've gone through. So. Okay. Yeah, I missed the first, I think, 10 minutes of lecture, so I just want to look oh, at that whole recording. Yeah, I'll, I shot that recording up for you guys too. Okay, so. Thanks. Okay. Okay, I'm, that, that's all I got, unless you guys have anything else. Sorry, uh, this is just, uh, um, it has nothing to do with the rest of class. I just had a quick question. Did you talk about the final exam in the sense of the date? Is that a confirmed date? December 18th will be a confirmed date, yeah. Okay. That's it's, all basically last, it's the last day of final exams. And the reason I did that, to give you guys two weeks to study for it, so. Okay. Study for it, so. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Sorry, somebody else had a question? Hey, Rafat, are you in some beach, or is that just uh, a... <laughs> 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 That looks, uh, that looks, that looks very nice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He's stuck in behind a beach. <laughs> okay, well, you guys have a good night, and um, I'll see you guys next week. Okay. Thank you. You too. Bye. Thanks. Bye. 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 Thank you.